Today we're going to look at John 5, verses 1 to 18, which I'll read first. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, in Hebrew called Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew that he'd been lying there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is troubled, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your pallet and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his pallet and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, The man who healed me said to me, Take up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you're well. Sin no more, that nothing worse befall you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews persecuted Jesus, because he did this on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working still, and I am working. This was why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his father, making himself equal with God. Well, This is a healing narrative, which is the third sign, the third miracle in John's Gospel. And it takes place at a Jewish feast, presumably not a major one, uh, such as the Passover, because there's no definite article. It may be a minor feast, like the Feast of Trumpets, New Year, but it's hard to know for sure. There's been a lot of uh, interest in this particular pool. Um, the pool is known as Bethsatha or Bethsaida or Bethesda. Um, and it was thought for a long time that the pool was a kind of literary invention since it couldn't be seen. There were all sorts of other buildings that had been erected above it. The site was excavated about a century ago but it was only recently that it was found to have four porticos and another side, pretty much just as described in the Gospel of John. It's most likely a mikvah, that's to say a pool for ritual cleansing. The fact that John describes the pool so exactly shows that he had an intimate knowledge of Jerusalem. And this is interesting because people will say, with some reason, that the Gospel of John is a more theological gospel than the Synoptic Gospels, um, and that it is less historically based. But this particular detail in chapter 5 of John shows that it does have very clear historical basis. In naming the Sheep Gate, John may be preparing the reader for the extensive use of in his Gospel of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. You'll note also that the sign, this miracle, occurs with water. Already we've seen Jesus baptised with water, and he turned water into wine, and living water, um, which quenches one's spiritual thirst, is offered to the woman in Samaria. And now we have water linked with healing. By this pool there lay a great many people who were blind, lame, or paralyzed. Now in other codices, 
Um, there's another verse which is not these days regarded as um, as binding. It says that they were waiting the moving of the water for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever stepped in first after the troubling of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. So this seems to be a folk legend of the day, which has been an annotate, annotated um, the gospel and then included in some codices of the gospel. One reason why people tend to exclude it is because it superstitiously suggests that being healed by God is a matter of luck or indeed competition. And that runs very much against the kind of thing that we get in the Gospels. There's one man there who has been ill for 38 years. And again, the exact number is, is interesting. It's not 40 years, as one might imagine, if it was used symbolically, like 40 years in the desert, 40, years in the, uh, 40 days in the wilderness. It's 38 and clearly, um, there must be a story about this man. It might have been pointed out to Jesus that he, in particular, had been there for uh, 38 years. And then Jesus will cure him, and he will be an exemplary cure. Notice that Jesus immediately goes up to him and says, Do you want to be healed? He takes the initiative in the event, and he asks if the man wishes to be made whole, in body and soul. So, also you'll remember that in some of these stories of healing, there's a definite connection at the beginning between sin and sickness. But here there's no mention of a link between sin and sickness, not at this part of the story, at least. So the sick man answers Jesus, Sir, Kyrie, it's a term of distinct respect, I've got no one to help me down there because he's paralyzed. Um, we may remember the story in uh, Mark chapter 2 of the paralytic who's cured by Jesus, but he has four men to carry him to Jesus. Here there's no one who will help the man. And the pool is said to heal only one person at a time. But it's a marked contrast that Jesus can heal anyone he wishes to at any time. Jesus immediately says to him, Rise, take up your pallet and walk. There's no prayer. There's no stretching out of the hand. There's no touching him. Um, a prophet might pray that the man be healed. Um, but here Jesus simply commands that he be cured. Namely, Jesus speaks with an extraordinary authority and confidence that it will happen. And of course, immediately, the man is cured. But that's not what is the troubling element in the story. Jesus commands him to lift up his bed mat and walk. And to do that on the Sabbath is a clear infraction of the Jewish law as the Pharisees see it. Have a look at Jeremiah 17, 22. So the story immediately introduces a drama. Jesus is cured on the Sabbath and has told the man to carry his bed mat, which counts as doing work on the Sabbath. For the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes then, Jesus would be commending the man to break the law, and this would count against him being the Messiah. It says, if you look on at verse 10, the Jews said to the man who was cured, now this is not all the Jewish people, it's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, not the entire people around there. And they have reason on their side that there's quite a lot of scripture that supports this. Exodus 20, verse 10. Exodus 31, verse 15. 
Leviticus 23 verse 7, Nehemiah 13 verse 19, and Jeremiah 17 21. All of which would have been well known to the scribes in particular. The cured man, however, has got no idea who has healed him. Jesus has acted very discreetly in the crowd and, as it were, incognito. But the uh, Pharisees keep asking him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your pallet and walk? Well, Jesus has withdrawn to the temple in order to avoid attention being focused upon him as a miracle worker. It's so important to see that although Jesus does perform many miracles, he doesn't want to be known as a healer or a miracle worker because that just distracts from the message of the gospel. He doesn't want public exposure for the wrong thing. The man who's been cured is the best witness of what has actually happened as John Chrysostom says. But Jesus encounters the man in the temple. Presumably the cured man has gone into the temple to give thanks to God for his cure. And then Jesus says, See, you're well. Sin no more, that nothing worse befall you. So Jesus is a man of his time, fully human. And he does associate sickness with sin. But he doesn't require a confession of the sin to heal the man. The man then goes away, now knowing who it was who's cured him, and tells the Pharisees. Now there's no editorial condemnation by John that the cured man has acted badly. It's just something that he could. But it sets the drama in action. This was why the Jews persecuted Jesus, because he did this on the Sabbath. And to do that would either be uh, an infraction of the law, which would militate against Jesus being the Messiah, or blasphemy, thinking that one is above the law as God is. In the Greek, the verb is given in the imperfect, were persecuting, which suggests that Jesus had been healing on the Sabbath uh, on other occasions. So this is an exemplary story about an exemplary healing. When Jesus responds to the Pharisees, he says, My father is working, and I am working. Jesus deliberately says, My father, not our father, or the the father of Israel. So Jesus is claiming to be the Son of the Father. Earlier, he's identified himself as the Son of Man. Now, more boldly, he identifies himself as the Son of God. And, of course, this is intolerable for the Pharisees. It's blasphemy. The interesting point, though, is that the Father is working. He's not still creating the world, but he's still sustaining the world and bringing the unrighteous to righteousness. And the Father and the Son are working together. Their work is the making whole of Israel and by extension the whole world. Again, we see that the cure is exemplary. It's the cure of one man, but the real intent behind it, of course, is the cure of the whole of Israel and the cure of of the whole world to make all of us whole. But the Jews in the story, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the the scribes, pick up on what they take to be blasphemy because Jesus seems to be making himself equal to God by being his son. They don't see that he is divine as well as human and that he doesn't commit the sin of blasphemy.